begin, I'm going to uh, use some of the hymns that were from Matins last Sunday, because I think they're, they really give us something to consider. Last Sunday in the Byzantine church, so we read the gospel of uh, the separation uh, of the goats and sheep, and those words uh, that the judge or in the words of Jesus, the king says, when I was hungry, you gave me to eat. When I was thirsty, you gave me to drink, etc." So the theme of uh, judgment is presented to us right before the beginning of, uh, of the fast of Lent. And so we'll begin with uh, three of the hymns that, uh, that are specific to, to last Sunday. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. What fear shall reign on that day when the judge will be seated on his awesome throne? The books will be opened and deeds revealed. The works of darkness shall be made known. The angels will travel through the nations and gather all. Come all you princes and kings, slaves and free, just and sinners, poor and rich. For the judge is coming to settle accounts with the whole world. Who will be able to bear his sight when the angels are witnesses to uncover our deeds, thoughts, and desires, those by day and those by night? Oh, what fear there shall be on that day. But before the end, O oh my soul, hasten to cry out, I am returning to you, O oh Lord. Save me in your goodness. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Daniel the prophet, a man greatly beloved, having seen the power of God, cried out, God is seated in judgment and the books are opened. O oh my soul, if you fast, do not deceive your neighbor. If you abstain from food, do not judge others lest you go to be burned like wax in the fire. But may Christ lead you freely to his heavenly kingdom, now and ever and forever. Amen. O oh, faithful, let us purify ourselves with repentance, the queen of virtues. Behold, it brings us an abundance of blessings. It dresses the wounds of passions. It reconciles sinners with the master. Therefore, let us embrace it with joy and cry out to Christ our God. You are risen from the dead. Keep us free from condemnation, for we glorify you as the only sinless one. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. One of the most ancient practices of Christianity is fasting. And, and I think it's, it's one of those themes which has gotten a little bit messed up in, in uh, practice. Uh, firstly, because it, it's been turned into more of an optional exercise uh, and it has been in some ways weakened by uh, exceptions. And, and that's one of the, the things that I think we struggle with and to figure out, you know, how to do it, why to do it, is it really all that important? There are, um, there are even different Protestant groups, you know, being here in Texas, so we see it all. And there are different groups who do like a, a kind of a symbolic fast, you know, for a specific thing. And, and it's interesting because <laughs> it is one of the most ancient practices of Christianity, and yet it is something which is, uh, has not been saved, in, in a sense, within, uh, within Christianity itself. It's been kind of relegated in some ways to that's what the, 
the priests and monks and nuns do. And, um, and then we don't see it as something that we do necessarily during Lent. Uh, during Lent, we abstain. And abstaining, you know, is from uh, eating specific foods. Uh, but for uh, uh, the idea of fasting is still something which is, is not regularly uh, talked about. And, and we separate them out. The, as themes, they are separated out. Fasting is one thing. Uh, prayer is another thing. And almsgiving is a third thing that is removed. And we don't understand then how the practice in the early church was an integrated practice. So first things first, I think, you know, there, there is a very specific reality when it comes to uh, fasting. Fasting is not a uniquely Christian practice but rather it comes from Judaism. It comes from the Old Testament. Isaiah himself uh, writes about it. And then God even gives him specific instructions as to what is the fast that is pleasing to God. And so let me share that with you because I think this bears uh, a lot of uh, um, information, it, it sheds some light on the words of Christ himself. So here, this is from Isaiah chapter 58. They now ask me about righteous judgment and desire to draw near to God saying, why have we fasted, but you did not see it? Why have we humbled our souls, but you did not know it? Because in the days of your fasts, you seek your own wills and mistreat those under your authority. If you fast for condemnations and quarrels and strike a humble man with your fists, why do you fast to me as you do today, so your voice may be heard in crying? I did not choose this fast, and such a day for a man to humble his soul, nor if you should bow your neck like a, like a ring and spread sackcloth and ashes under yourself, could you thus call such a fast acceptable? I did not choose such a fast, says the Lord. Rather, loose every bond of wrongdoing, untie the knots of violent dealings, cancel the debts of, debts of the oppressed, and tear apart every unjust contract. Break your bread for the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house. If you see a naked man, clothe him, nor shall you disregard your offspring in your own household. Then your light shall break forth as the morning, and your healing shall spring forth quickly. Your righteousness shall go before you, and the glory of God shall cover you. Then you shall cry out, and God will hear you. While you are still speaking, he will say, Behold, I am here. If you take away your fetter and the pointing of the finger and the word of grumbling, and if you give bread to the hungry from your soul and satisfy the humble soul, then your light shall rise up in the darkness and your darkness shall be as midday. God shall be with you continually and you shall be satisfied as your soul desires. Now, these are, these are words which, you know, we... we tend to think of fasting as being just a practice okay we're giving up food and you know that's that's it certain items we're not eating but here in Isaiah this is the fasting that is pleasing to God and and we can hear already there are echoes of judgment 
there are echoes of uh, alms giving and there are echoes of prayer. And see for the early church, so it was this reality that flowed from one thing into the other. So fasting, and we can, you know, we go, go to Matthew's gospel, uh, chapter six specifically, which tells us about each of these aspects of Lenten observance. So fasting, and we can kind of put ab abstinence from meat uh, into, it is a part of fasting in a sense, because there is a um, giving up of a certain food, but fasting is a little more involved. Uh, it's a little, there are more things that are given up, but we won't really go into that right now. The idea of fasting, it is a uh, part of what the church calls ascesis or asceticism. And so it is a spiritual training or exercise. The word ascesis, uh, which gives us the English term that we use ascetic or asceticism, um, it means literally a training or exercise. And so the way that it is viewed, fasting does not stand alone as prayer does not stand alone, as almsgiving does not stand alone, but rather they are integrated parts of the same Lenten observance. And so in the idea of uh, food, and food is the, one of the primary needs of every human being. Uh, food can make a nation rich or bring a nation to its knees. It can destroy peoples. Civilizations have been destroyed because of famine. And so food is very, very important. And even looking biblically, remember the story of Joseph, who was sold into slavery in Egypt so that they could survive a famine as it was God's plan. Because a famine of lengthy duration could, again, destroy a nation or a civilization. And so now, so that's food kind of in the bigger picture. But then in our daily uh, need, food is also a uh, sign of wealth, comfort. It is a, a sign of economic status. Uh, there are people in the world today who do not know where their next meal is coming from. And there are uh, many of us who, uh, you know, in considering the next meal, all we have to do is pop open the fridge and pull some, something out of the freezer. And so, and then of course, all the realities in between. And so, although food for us is something that we don't take for granted, food is something that is easily and readily available. And food does, to a certain degree, also control us. And so it, many of our patterns, our daily patterns, are subject to the way we eat. There are foods that enhance our lives. There are foods that are not so good for us. So the way that we're looking at ascetic life and ascesis is getting control of something that is human, something that we understand, something that we can potentially control. And then through exercise, we take it to a higher level. And so it is, it is looking at cultivating a spiritual life through 
very material uh, exercises. And so uh, fasting as a practice is looked at within the scope of Lent specifically, is looked at as a simplification of what we eat, where not only it, the things we eat are simpler because there is not as much of a choice as there might normally be, especially if you take away certain items, but less time is taken also by planning a meal, preparing a meal, because the foods are simpler. And then because the foods are simpler, our usual budget for preparing that meal, that usual budget is also uh, hopefully uh, we save some money and that money should be then put aside so that it could go to help the poor. And then the time that we gain from not spending so much time both shopping and preparing meals, that time can be spent in church, in uh, reading from the Bible, the gospel, and prayer. And so, and, I, and spending time in church as well as reading from scriptures is prayer too. So right there, we have the entire picture of fasting, prayer, and almsgiving. Now, why is fasting important? Because it seems, you know, in, in our world today, it seems so passe. It is something when you talk to your friends who are uh, not Catholic or not Eastern Christian, uh, you know, they don't really understand why would we want to deprive ourselves of something that we work so hard to, to have. And also many of them look at it as a blessing. God blessed me with this abundance and so I have food. And so why would I give it up? And they don't understand that there is a background for fasting. And fasting really, it comes directly from the example that Christ gave us. So firstly, as I mentioned before, from the Gospel of Matthew uh, chapter 6, and explicitly there right, right away, the first three sections, how to give alms, how to pray, and how to fast. And, and the words, I think, should ring familiar. How to give alms. Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets that they may have glory from men. Now, uh, this is specifically, you know, got to put it into the context. So Jesus here is talking about the Pharisees because the, the Pharisees were the ones who within Judaism cultivated uh, the fasting during the week, specifically on Mondays and Thursdays. Uh, typically, the Jews were obligated to fast uh, only in preparation for the celebration of Jewish New Year on the Day of Atonement. And so, but the, the Pharisees were kind of known for flaunting some of their religious practices. So, but nonetheless, you know, there, there are those who do take pride in the charity they do. You know, so this is definitely, I think, still a good warning. Then, how to pray. When you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. 
But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And then he goes on and gives the words of the Our Father. And then he continues, how to fast. Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that you do not appear to men to be fasting but to your father who is in the secret place and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. So, and the other interesting thing is that on all three of these, on all three of these, the wording it cannot really be confused. It is when you give alms, when you pray, when you fast. So it's not if, because some of these practices people understand as being optional. You get to choose to do this. I mean, yes, you do choose to do this, but it is out of a sense of obligation. This is a part of Christian life. And so in following the example of Jesus, we do this. So it is, it is an important part of how we live our faith. The understanding though, fasting, this practice, so even though, so Jesus mentions kind of the how-to quite specifically, but uh, when we look at the actual reason for fasting, fasting was a way of preparing oneself for a specific encounter with God or an encounter through a feast. And so Judaism has that with the preparation for the new year, that at the end of the old year, the day of atonement, one fasts as a penitential act. But also we see the same preparation happens to, um, to Moses before he goes up to encounter God on Mount Sinai. He also fasts. Then the priests who served in the temple before they went to serve, such as we know, Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, went to serve in the temple where the angel of the Lord appeared before him, telling him that he would be the father of John, that he and Elizabeth would have a child. Before he went into the Holy of Holies, he would have fasted in preparation for a significant amount of days. What the fast consists of, I mean, it's not necessarily bread and water fast. There are different types of fast, and uh, we'll talk about that a little later, but uh, what kind of fast is not important. It was a, uh, a fast that did uh, limit, it simplified that which one would consume. Now, fasting for us during Lent is connected to the example that we see in uh, what Christ did when he went to the desert before the beginning of his ministry. And uh, Lent has always been, from the earliest church, compared to the 40 days that Christ spent in, in the desert. And we hear specifically there are uh, three sins that are uh, in the example of Christ that are fought against through the experience of desert fasting and prayer. And, uh, and so we hear the, the devil when he comes and he tempts, uh, he tempts Jesus. So first of all, First of all, he, he, he is, Jesus is told by Satan to demonstrate his power by changing stones into bread to satisfy his hunger because he was fasting. 
And uh, then secondly, the Lord was tempted by Satan uh, that if he were indeed the son of God, that he, would, he were to throw himself from the pinnacle of the temple and he would not be hurt. And then finally, uh, Satan took Jesus to the high mountain and told him that if he would fall down and worship Satan, everything would, all these things that he can see would be given to him. So the three sins which are uh, fought against in, uh, in this example is, well, firstly, the uh, the changing of uh, of the stones into bread was a demonstration of self control. Secondly, throwing himself from the temple, from the uh, the pinnacle of the temple, and not being hurt to prove to say that he was indeed the son of God was against the sin of pride. And thirdly, when Satan offers him, offers Jesus the kingdoms of the world, it is about possessions. And these three items become, um, they become kind of uh, essential for progress and growth in spiritual life. Pride, power, and you can say that that, that can be also interpreted as uh, control, as uh, egotism. And then possession, well, that's an easy one that we can understand because of the stuff that we have the positions that we hold, the things that, that we own, that are ours. These practices, I guess, through the practice of, of fasting, we become less prideful. We surrender our control by controlling what we consume and we focus more on that which is of God as opposed to that which is earthly. This is compared to Adam and Eve because they in the garden, they fail the temptation of power by desiring to know the difference between good and evil. They fail the temptation of pride by desiring to be like God. And they fail the temptation of possessions because they wanted it all, especially the fruit of the tree that they were not to touch. And so the church sees this juxtaposition between Adam and Eve bringing all humanity down through their sin. And then Christ through his turning away from the temptation of the devil, that he lifts humanity up. And he shows us through his example of how to overcome those sins which initially separated us from God, pride, power, and possessions. And that then becomes the, uh, the foundation for, uh, for the spiritual life, for ascesis. But why do we have to do it? After all, uh, we are a people of the resurrection. So why are we reliving something difficult, something that takes us on a path of uh, self-denial, on a path of uh, giving something up. Well, that is because 
we are the church of the apostles. We are the church who is now preparing and purifying ourselves for the return of Christ. So in the early church, in the Acts of the Apostles, we hear echoed, and we also hear this actually in the epistles. Uh, even Paul says that he believes that Jesus's return is imminent. And so many among the early Christians, they fasted as a way, and, and this, it wasn't a, just about a practice that you do, you know, like we do Lent every year, but rather they looked at it as, as being spiritually fit through fasting, prayer, and, and good works, that they would be prepared for Jesus's return. Because Jesus's words also indicated that he would possibly return soon. And he told them when they asked about his return, he told them that they should just be prepared. Don't focus on reading the signs and trying to figure out when that will happen. Be prepared. And so Lent becomes, because obviously here we are, uh, you know, some almost 2,000 years later, and Jesus hasn't returned. Many generations have passed. Much history has also passed. And Jesus has not yet returned. The church has changed its way of looking at uh, life and has gone from a missionary evangelistic evangelizing uh, apostolic entity to having buildings and schools and institutions. Things have changed. And yet, essentially, we are still in the same reality. We just have more stuff. But we are still a people who are waiting the return of Christ. And so for us, Lent becomes another season of renewal, renovation, and return. And again, we're focused on the coming of Christ. Now, in the early church, um, Holy Week has always been focused on the image of Christ from the scourging. So he was seated with the crown of thorns, holding the reed and clothed in the scarlet uh, cloak over his shoulders. And that image in the early church was referred to as Christ the bridegroom. Because that image is one of the images that Jesus uses to talk about his return. Remember the parable of the foolish and the wise virgins. Five were prepared and five were not. And when the bridegroom arrived, those who were prepared those who had oil for their lanterns, they were able to enter into the wedding banquet as a metaphor for the kingdom of God. And those who did not have oil and had to go out looking for oil, they were left out of the wedding banquet. And so, and that's the theme that is brought to us immediately from Palm Sunday, because on Palm Sunday, we see the uh, revelation of the Messiah and his recognition by the people of Israel. And so, but he is recognized by some, but by the end of the week, he is not wanted by most. And so that's why the church then turns it immediately from Christ who triumphantly, gloriously enters into Jerusalem, fulfilling all of the long list of requirements 
of the, the characteristics and uh, what the prophet said about the Messiah. So he fulfills that. But then ultimately he still goes to be crucified where the people reject him. However, we're not focused as church simply on the observance of Lent and then coming to like a recreation of the Passion Week. We're not coming to it simply as a commemoration of what happened some 2000 years ago, but rather we are waiting for the return of Christ. And so that tale of the, of the wise virgins and the foolish virgins, that becomes the, one of the big themes of Holy Week. Because as Christ has now fulfilled uh, the messianic hope of the people of Israel, so now we are waiting for him to come and fulfill the promise he has made to humanity. And so we're still doing, that's why one of the earliest practices of the church was Lent. Because although we celebrated from the earliest church, the feast of the resurrection of Christ, it came with a period of preparation because the early Christians, although they celebrated the resurrection, they were also very much aware that Jesus would be returning very soon. And so Lent has been an essential part of the Christian life for, from the beginning and for different reasons than perhaps we might think. It is, yes, it is a, a time to contemplate the beauty of God's promise fulfilled and salvation and the fullness of life as promised through the death and resurrection of Christ. But it also is a time to contemplate his return. And so that's why we get this. We return to the garden. We consider what happened in the garden. We go to the desert with Christ where he is tempted. And then we go to Jerusalem with him. But there in Jerusalem, we await his return, his second coming. And so Lent then has this aspect of waiting which, where fasting becomes a natural part of that preparation. Because you, you have to think, well, uh, you know, how, how are we going to prepare for the return of Christ? Well, it is, it is through spiritual growth, through the pursuit of virtues, through growth, which is more focused on God, through more trust in God. And that is attained through prayer, through fasting, and through acts of kindness or almsgiving, if you like. But it is all interconnected, and it is all that we use then to uh, become that which is uh, appropriate and that which is uh, prepared to be of God. So it is, it is a season of purification. And some of that does happen through the simplification of uh, what we consume. But here we go back again to Isaiah. Isaiah, in his description of fasting, said very little about food. He actually fo focused much more on fasting from other things like anger, from being prideful. And so, uh, so that's one of the things that I'd like to share with you because the fathers are wonderful. They teach us so much about the faith that we have received. 
and uh, and they're surprisingly uh, contemporary, even in what how they say what they say. So this is from Saint John Chrysostom. The value of fasting consists not only in avoiding certain foods, but in giving up sinful practices. The person who limits his fast only to abstaining from meat is the one who especially lowers the value of it. Do you fast? Prove it by doing good works. If you see someone in need, take pity on them. If you see a friend being honored, don't get jealous of him. For a true fast, you cannot fast only with your mouth. You must fast with your eye, your ear, your feet, your hands, and all parts of your body. You fast with your hands by keeping them pure, doing from doing greedy things. You fast with your feet by not going to see forbidden shows. You fast with your eyes by not letting them look upon impure pictures. Because if this is forbidden or unlawful, it mars your fast and threatens the safety of your soul. But if you look at things which are lawful and safe, you increase your fast. For what you see with your eye influences your conduct. It would be very foolish to eliminate or give up meat and other foods of the fast, but feed with your eyes upon other things which are forbidden. You don't eat meat, you say, but you allow yourself to listen to lewd things. You must fast with your ears too. Another way of fasting with your ears is not to listen to those who speak evil or untrue things about others. Thou shalt not receive an idle report. This is especially true of rumors, gossip, untruths, which are said to harm another. Besides fasting with your mouth by not eating certain foods, your mouth should also fast from foul language or saying lies about others. For what good is it if you don't eat meat or poultry and yet you bite and devour your fellow man? The tremendous, tremendous words that ring ever true even today. Because it's, it's not just, and you know, yes, it, it gets a little more complicated when you open up fasting and when you uh, embrace fasting as an exercise of spiritual growth and uh, asceticism. But it is, it is something that is integrated. It is something that, requires an approach which is not just about selective observance but rather there's a bigger reality because after all you know you think about it yes we eat food and so the food goes inside us it becomes a part of us but then isn't it true of also what we see and what we hear and what we speak that which has said that also becomes a part of us. And so it's, it's, you know, and sometimes that can be the more dangerous thing in our spiritual life. Now, the, um, the importance of prayer and repentance. Prayer and repentance is in this, I would say it is fundamental. And we've heard coming into Lent, so we've, we've had the opportunity to consider the examples of the publican and the Pharisee, of Zacchaeus, who comes uh, and climbs the sycamore tree trying to see Jesus, uh, and also the prodigal son, and 
the the understanding that I think the church wants us to take from these uh, three beautiful uh, episodes in the gospel, well, two episodes, and or rather one episode and two parables. Uh, the church wants us to understand, firstly, that Zacchaeus, who didn't know exactly why he needed to see Jesus, his desire to see Jesus was stronger than his own pride, than his own, what he could concoct to keep him from Jesus. So he went after him. That desire is something that we must nurture. Secondly, the uh, Pharisee and the publican, the publican who for the people of Israel was considered to be garbage. They were traitors. They were the ones who had uh, become a part of the problem. Uh, the Romans were using them, who were Jews, who were within Judaism, to take advantage of the people of Israel and take their money. And, and so the uh, attitude of the publican who comes into the temple where people would know who he is. People would recognize him because they dressed in a specific way. And yet he goes in also not concerned about what people might say. He finds a place in the back of the temple and there his prayer is, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And so it is that attitude of humility before God. And then finally, the example of the prodigal son, the prodigal son who has everything. He has, he is blessed by God with a family that he is connected to, financial blessings through his family, his father's wealth. He belongs to the people of Israel, so he, has, he is part of the covenant, and he lives on the land that God gave his people Israel, and he rejects all of that. He leaves the, his homeland, he rejects his faith heritage and ends up with pigs, which is impurity. He rejects his, uh, his father. And, uh, and he rejects his people. And so another hopeless cause. And there the focus is not his attitude. Because his attitude, he returns back to his father. We're not sure why. Last we heard in the parable, he was hungry. And so he was reminded that his father gives food to, uh, to the servants. So he goes back uh, to, uh, uh, to the father, we're not sure why, but there the focus is the mercy of God. And it is a mercy, a love, it's all interconnected. And it is, it comes without any conditions. It comes without any need for speech or talk or words. And it is granted when the sinner comes to the father. And so he doesn't have to earn it. He doesn't have to do anything specific. He just has to return to the father. And so I think these are these themes which we get coming into the season of uh, Lent. These themes prepare us so that we can make sure that our attitude before the season, coming in into the season, which is a season of ascesis, of ascetic challenge and exercise and training and growth, this season would be good. So we place before ourselves 
those two attitudes, the desire to see Jesus face to face and humility before God. And then we understand that God awaits us with open arms. In that scheme, that's where forgiveness occurs. And so then it is the embrace of the Father. And so the exercises we do through prayer, through fasting, through acts of kindness, these are all ways that we grow in that relationship with God. So just as a little bit of a, say, a review, prayer and fasting go together. They can't really be separated. And the fasting that pleases God is the one we hear about in Isaiah and then is echoed by Jesus. It is a fasting that is connected to the way that we live. So it's not simply a giving up of food or certain items, but it is balanced out through generosity and kindness. That fasting should not turn us into, you know, an ogre or someone who is mean because we're now deprived of what we would like to eat. You know, we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't look or assume that kind of an attitude because that is not truly fasting. Scriptures tell us a lot about fasting. And there is more teaching in the New Testament about fasting than there is about repentance and confession. And that's kind of an interesting fact because it means that obviously fasting is important. Jesus taught more about fasting than baptism and the Last Supper. And in the, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, Jesus specifically teaches about fasting that pleases God. It is connected with acts of righteousness like charity and prayer. Through fasting, Jesus calls his followers to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. Should Christians fast today? Well, if the example of Jesus and his teaching is anything to follow, then we see he fasted during his 40-day period of temptation in the wilderness. And when he taught about the subject of fasting, he assumed that his followers would be fasting because he said, when? when you fast, not if. And then he also told his disciples that they would fast when he was gone. He taught how to fast so that it would be pleasing to God. And that when fasting is done properly, it would incur God's good grace. There were times that were appropriate for fasting, and there were occasions when fasting and prayer had to be done together. If you remember, that is specific to the exercising of demons. In the early church, we find clear examples of the church fasting in Antioch, where they fasted as part of their service to the Lord, and they fast and pray when they sent out Paul and Barnabas. We hear in the Acts of the Apostles that every church in Galatia fasted. 
And the church in Galatia also fasted when they appointed their leaders. Paul also himself fasted and said that fasting was one of the things which proved him as a minister of Christ. He also questions the practice of fasting and says, are we not commanded to imitate Christ? So today, fasting, it has its own historical base and understanding. Today, people fast for different reasons. So some people do it for health reasons. There are different kinds of dietary fasts. We fast, for example, as part of medical treatments. There are, uh, again, certain diets that are uh, actually even take the word fast, such as intermittent fasting. So there are different practices, but that's not what the Christian concept of fasting is about. Those types of fasts, even though they may be good for us, they may be necessary when it comes to medicine and medical procedures, the fruit of that fasting is our physical wellness. The fruit of Christian fasting is to greater connection with God and more detachment from that which is of the earth. Christians should fast when seeking God's help. Just like in the Old Testament, the people of Israel fasted in times of war or the threat of it. Think about Pope Francis asked us to pray and fast uh, next Wednesday on March 2nd for peace in Ukraine, doing exactly what the Israelites did when threatened by war. The Israelites fasted when a loved one was sick, as did David. They fasted when seeking God's forgiveness. They fasted when seeking God's protection. In the New Testament, fasting occurs when dealing with temptation, when serving the Lord, such as in the church of Antioch. It also occurs when dealing with evil, that certain demons can only be exercised through prayer and fasting. Fasting should be done together with prayer. When fasting is done properly, it humbles the soul and chastens the soul, which is what we read in Psalm 35 and Psalm 69. And then the prophecy of Ezra, the prayers of the humble are more likely to be heard. So when should we fast then as Christians? We should fast not only during Lent, but whenever we desire God's help. Sometimes that is when we are faced with temptations or when we want to pray for someone who is close to us. Sometimes we should pray as a parish for special needs in our communities. But always fasting should be accompanied by prayer because that is when God answers prayer through persistence, through fasting. And that is fasting in the way that is pleasing to God. It is a fasting which is done privately and quietly, a fasting that doesn't seek to become a source of praise and adulation. 
So fasting is not just a trend. It is not something that is new, but rather it is steeped in the rich experience of the Bible, indeed, not only the church. What we read in the Old Testament, the example provided by Christ, is something that is for us necessary in the way that we exercise and live our own vocation, our own calling to become closer to God. So what then do we do with our Lenten observance? So there are marked differences between uh, the way that Lent is observed in uh, the Western church and in the Eastern churches. And in the Eastern churches, there are many different uh, observances. So it's, it depends, every church has its own canon law and that law dictates then how uh, one is to observe the fast. So I looked up the way that it is expressed in the West. And uh, fasting is uh, for the days of penance. So in the West, Canon Law, uh, Canon 1249 says, the divine law binds all the Christian faithful to do penance, each in his or, or her own way, in order for all to be united among themselves by some common observance of penance. However, penitential days are prescribed on which the faithful, the Christian faith, will devote themselves in a special way to prayer, perform works of piety and charity, and deny themselves by fulfilling their own obligations more faithfully, and especially by observing fast and abstinence according to the norm of the following canons. And so uh, Canon 1250, the penitential days and times in the universal church are every Friday of the whole year and the season of Lent. Canon 1251, abstinence from meat or from some other food as determined by the Episcopal Conference is to be observed on all Fridays unless a solemnity should fall on a Friday. Abstinence and fasting are to be observed on Ash Wednesday and Good Friday. Uh, and then it goes into the age requirements. Uh, so abstinence binds those who have completed their 14th year. Fasting are... Uh, those who have attained their majority, which I guess is 18, until the beginning of their 60th year. So canon law, I, ha I hate to say this, has really taken the fun out of fasting because it, you know, it tries to express it in a way that is um, clear so that you know, we know what we're supposed to be doing and, um, and unfortunately, what is very often encouraged is to follow the law. Because after all, it explains it. But there isn't a, uh, a greater impetus to do something more. And, uh, you know, and I, I think it's, it's particularly uh, sad that there is... Um, an age, you know, a cutoff age for both beginning uh, abstinence and fasting, as well as uh, no longer abstaining and fasting. Because it's kind of like, you know, okay, if, if we have that kind of an exception, then, you know, what other exceptions are there? You know, do you have to go to church? You know, the some of the, the obligation kind of becomes a little fuzzy there. And uh, so I, I think, unfortunately, it's in its uh, 
and its expression of uh, the law and having clarity in the law, it also becomes a little bit of a limitation. So let me share with you then what is the requirement for uh, the Byzantine Catholic Church in the United States. Uh, so we, we have simple abstinence. The law of simple abstinence forbids the use of meat, but permits the use of eggs and dairy products. All faithful of the, of the archeparchy who receive the Eucharist are obliged to observe simple abstinence when prescribed. Abstinence is obligatory on all Wednesdays and Fridays of the great fast. Strict abstinence, the law of strict abstinence uh, forbids the use and consumption of all meat, eggs, and dairy products. All the faithful of the archeparchy who receive the Eucharist are obliged to observe strict abstinence when prescribed. Strict, strict abstinence is observed on Pure Monday, which is the first day of the Great Fast, and on Great and Holy Friday. And uh, that's it. <laughs> there are no ages, there's no cut off. Uh, it's expected that, you know, a family does this together that children participate as much as they can, and that this is also to be taken as a foundation that you build upon. So uh, this is the, the basic requirement. And then one can uh, choose to fast more, to remove more things like maybe have no meat Monday through Friday, um, you know, or go full vegan, you know, no meat, dairy, or egg products uh, for the whole of great fast of Lent. But it is, it's a beginning. This is a beginning. So that, that's why you notice there's a different tone in the way that the law is expressed. Uh, because this is, it, it's adopted, I, even our laws have adopted some of the terminology that is used in, in Roman canon law, but it still stops before it starts to like over define. So this way you, you get a sense that there is still, this is the minimum, you know, let's build on this. So um, and then, of course, you know, the, the other thing in the in the Byzantine church also, we fast from the divine liturgy. So Monday through Friday, there is no divine liturgy, but rather we have services such as the liturgy of the pre-sanctified gifts, which is Lenten Vespers with the distribution of communion that has been reserved from the previous weekend. And so, but it's, it's done because the divine liturgy is a celebration of the resurrection. And so in a, in a way it also, uh, it also puts us into that correct uh, attitude that even what we celebrate uh, in the liturgy is not really penitential, I mean, it, it does bring us to the cross, but it most importantly brings us to the empty tomb. <coughs> so that understanding is then emphasized by the services uh, that are prayed in the church. And I think this is very similar in the Roman Catholic Church. There are many different Lenten services, which also um, enhance the way that we uh, celebrate uh, the season of Lent and give us the opportunity to, um, to slowly participate and receive that fullness of mercy and reconciliation. So I'd like to open the floor to questions because I'm sure there are questions when it comes to uh, Lent, there are always uh, questions. So... Well, 
you know, we, we like to control uh, more than we really do control. You know, there, there, is, there is a sense of, of um, trying to plan our lives out. And, and we even try to sometimes control our relationship with God. And, you know, that's why questions of trust always come up, you know, in, in, trust, in God we trust. We have that on our money, ironically. And, and so, but, the, but we still, we like to have a certain understanding that um, realistically, or we think that we have God figured out. We have uh, our, our own spiritual life kind of plotted out. And the practice of fasting actually sets us back to the one thing that we do control. We control what we eat. That it, it's almost, it's, it's, it's a humbling in a way that we have to give up all of the other things that we pretend we control, but we really don't. And then go back to that, which is the most basic thing and realize that even that is difficult to control. And so, and if we can't control our own will to eat whatever we want to eat, if we can't control that, then we don't really control anything else. And so that's, it's an exercise, you could almost say, in the presence of God. So it, the way that we uh, focus our energy on uh, committing to uh, a specific fasting regimen, that becomes then a metaphor or even an example for the rest of our life, for what else we try to um, control in some sense before God. And it does take away, it does focus us a little bit uh, on different realities. So uh, for example, a lot of times, you know, we go to restaurants, we eat, or even at home, we take what we want and we do it mechanically you know it's it's not doesn't require that much thought even if sometimes if it's an elaborate meal we know what we like you know you go straight for it when you take all that away you become a lot more aware of what you're eating and you become aware in a sense that actually can bring you closer to god where you can experience gratitude, you know, that, you know, I may not have an apple pie, but I have one apple. And boy, does it taste good. <laughs> and so that even that can become a moment of encounter because we're simplifying ourselves before God. And so there becomes more room for God to be visible right there before us. So fasting, it's, and fasting is just the, the, the fasting from food is again, that's only the one. There's like a long list. Remember there was all that about uh, gossip and talking to other people, seeing things that are bad. So it's like, so fasting is, it's a lot of stuff. Now, all those things we do control. So where we might think we control God, but the reality is we do have more control over what we expose ourselves to, what we listen to, what we say, what we eat. And so if we're more in touch with ourselves in that sense, then ultimately cleaning that up, clearing that up, and turning to the word of God to guide our actions and to guide, you know, Jesus's example to guide us will mean that we become more connected to God. That 
that is exactly the point. The, uh, the practice of fasting is very intimately connected to monasticism, to living in monastic communities. And for the church, the monastic life is called the angelic life. It is called the, it's the ideal. So it is supposed to be, those are the people who have completely dedicated their everyday life to God and to seeking God and growing in that relationship. And so the, the hope, you know, we, we do the practices that we do. If you, if you go, especially during Lent and read about uh, fasting and prayer, most of the writings you will read are from monasteries written by monks and nuns because they're the ones who do it in the most authentic way. For them, it's not just a season. It is a lifetime. And so I think when we do it, a part of it is, like I said, it is that preparation for the encounter with Christ who will come again. But it is also hope that through the season, we will find different uh, aspects that we can integrate into our lives that will be better. And, you know, because Lent without growth is not good Lent. You know, it's, it's kind of the same when people go on retreat. It's like, you should come back from retreat better. And you should see with clarity the things that you need to change or adjust. And so then when you get back into the normal, you know what you have to do so that your life is better, richer, and more connected to God. And so, yes, so I, I think that's, that is one of the direct, I would say one of the goals of Lent is that this practice enhance life with God. And that because of that, it becomes uh, integrated in some way, you know, to, um, to our daily reality, not just in Lent. You know, I, I think the importance is to maintain some sort of a, um, a spiritual connectedness. So that because it, it's easy to become distracted so that then the focus becomes, well, you know, I'd like to get to a certain, like, I, I don't think, I think number one, during fasting, don't weigh yourself. <laughs> don't let yourself get distracted. That's the devil in the details. You know, like it's while it is a nice perk and, you know, health, better health is always a blessing that does come from God. You have to keep that focus, stay focused on, you know, I'm doing this for another reason. And don't limit it only to a fasting, which is about food. Keep it integrated so that it is also about doing good, you know, so this way it kind of get ba gets balanced out, but you're also not focused only on that one aspect. There is, during Lent, for example, there is a way of uh, spiritual reading, for example, the Divine Ladder of St. John Klimakos. It, it's a very complex book that can be read on a daily basis, you know, to use like for meditation. Um, also, uh, the, the canon of St. Andrew of Crete is used in many uh, Eastern churches as uh, Lenten reading, you know, so keep it balanced out so that it's, you're not drawn into the weight loss as, and that doesn't become than by accident, the goal, because that's uh, uh, not a bad thing, 
but where it goes bad is where our focus changes. And then if we're focused on that, then the other things are not being taken care of. This is a problem which Jesus had with the Pharisees, that their observance was perfect. Everything they did in temple and synagogue, you know, they were respected. They spent all day reading the law and, and they memorized what they learned, uh, but it was superficial. They wanted people to recognize them. And, uh, and so they, the goal was gaining the respect of people. It was not, you know, becoming closer to God. The practice of fasting, um, it, it is something, you know, that is supposed to be done um, secretly, you know, when, when Jesus tells us how we are to fast, so we're not supposed to wear that, you know, publicly. And so I, I have, you know, I run into that problem sometimes if you get invited somewhere and, you know, to someone's home and, uh, you know, there was no question made about fasting or you know if I eat this or that so then you know that you could make a scene which would be the wrong thing to do <laughs> you know or you sit there and and kind of eat in a discreet way without overdoing it you know and and uh, and that that is that is the right spirit of fasting you know, even when it comes to, uh, I was reading a, an article from a, a priest friend of mine um, about the substitution craze, you know, that um, now if you don't want to eat meat, so you've got like, you know, fake chicken, it tastes like chicken, and you got all these substitute products and, um, you know, different kinds of uh, fake cheese, you know, cashew sour cream and things like that. So you can, you can get, get into that. And, um, and that's not, that's not really in the spirit of fasting. Um, Cause it, it should, it should really be a simplification. And a lot of these alternative products, they're quite expensive, you know? So, so it's like, you're actually, paying more than you would if you were buying real meat. And so, you know, that's, that's not in the, in the spirit of fasting. It should also be something which is more humble. And so the, the product, so it's, it becomes, it's something, uh, fasting, it takes uh, a bit of um, preparation to kind of come into it. And you have to think about certain things, you know, and how you're going to do it and make a plan. Um, it's always better to begin simple. Remove the things that, you know, I would say are most common for you. And, uh, you know, and, and just one or two of the things, you know, so it's like, um, and, and then... Uh, you know, that's what, that's how you begin to build on it. Um, when, you know, a lot, a lot of people like to embrace the whole fast, like really enthusiastically. So, you know, with, with the way that it's done in the Byzantine uh, Christian tradition, um, fasting, you've got abstinence, so no meat, which would be like on Wednesdays and Fridays throughout the rest of the year. And then during Lent, you've got uh, the fasting, which is, it's not so much about the size. So it's not like one meal and two mini meals or something. That's, that's not usually what they talk about, but they remove 
uh, all animal products, uh, all dairy, all egg products, and, uh, and in some traditions also fish. And that would be fish that has blood and a backbone because it's considered, since it has a backbone and blood, it's considered to be um, an animal. Uh, meanwhile, what you can eat are, um, are sea creatures that don't have any blood or a backbone. You know, so things like uh, shrimp, uh, scallops, uh, lobster, you know, <laughs> and the list goes <laughs> pretty expensive right away. And, um, you know, and again, that's not so much in the spirit of the fast either. So it's, it's uh, you, have to, you have to make your own commitment to that. Uh, it's easy to get enthusiastic, especially, you know, there's, there are wonderful things online. There are, uh, you know, groups which offer like uh, guidance on how to keep uh, the Lenten fast. Uh, even recipes and things like that. But one could lose a lot of time in that. And I think that's where that can become then a focus, you know, because you're watching videos of how to cook, you know, some Greek thing that has, you know, and, and all of a sudden you're, you've changed your diet, but you're still using as much time as you did before, if not more. Now looking for, you know, obscure products in your supermarket that, you know, you don't know if they have it or not. And, and, it, and that's not the point. The point is keep it simple. And, um, you know, and so like, for example, even with the products, for, for example, you know, so there, there are some products that have some residual egg product in it, like some of the pastas, for example. And uh, so, you know, you, you don't want to get into that place of where you're the one in the supermarket who's reading the fine print, you know. Obviously, noodles that are called egg noodles are probably not the ones you want to eat. But when it comes to like Italian pastas, so technically they're not made with egg. And so, uh, but some of the products do have some egg. But to be there reading the label, again, the focus then becomes much more what you're doing than the actual end, which is, you know, to simplify, make it more effortless and yet more controlled, more thought out. And, um, you know, it, it's, it is a, it's a change, which is for the best it is a change which which can but the you know we are human beings and we do get pulled into these little things ourselves you know where you kind of start to focus on the products and substitution and you know all of a sudden lent becomes like a diet but it's not again it's not it's got to be equaled out fasting prayer almsgiving it has it's, it's a complete package deal reality. You know, that's, that's the way you can keep Lent. And, and a Lent that is really fruitful, a Lent that does change you in, you know, different ways, different levels. And, uh, you know, and thankfully, thank God, we do have a lot of resources out there to encourage us so that, you know, we're not kind of, reinventing anything but you have to be vigilant to you know stay focused on what the goal is so that we don't end up focusing on some of the minutia that are part of the journey I think, you know, some, some of this is also, it's the fruit of some of the legalism that's gone a little crazy. You know, like I, I think, for example, if you have people who are starving, uh, you know, they can eat whatever they can find. That's fine. You know, nobody's going to be 
they're like, you know, oh, throw that back. You can't have that because that's an animal and it's Friday. But people get a little, little too legalistic about it. And then that's, then you end up with these kinds of local uh, traditions. So in, in our country, the weird place is Louisiana. And in Louisiana, the, the bishops there uh, got the Vatican to okay uh, their request that alligator be considered a fish, you know, which is like, it's, a, uh, it's, it's, it is, uh, it's a travesty, but they also uh, have the same thing. Cause I think in Louisiana, there are also capybaras. So I think they're also on the list. I think like a muskrat is, so they've got, they've got, and, and there might even be a bird. I mean, it's a long list. Obviously people in Louisiana are hungry. And uh, so they have, they have a number of animals that have been decreed by the Vatican as uh, aquatic animals. So they are good for Fridays of Lent. But, you know, I mean, at this point, I, I, think, I think in making it simpler and easier, they've kind of made the obligation almost seem foolish. You know, and, and it's like, because today, anywhere you live in this country, you can get substitute stuff. You know, there's, in Louisiana, for example, um, you know, there's a tradition of uh, red beans and rice. You know, you can do that meatless, do that on a Friday and you don't have to throw in any of the animals, you know, but, but they, it's become so simple that it's almost, that's, that's why fasting is not a big thing in the West anymore, in Western Christianity. It's, it's not taken as seriously anymore. Um, you know, one of the things that I find very distressing is when, um, you know, St. Patrick's Day falls on a Friday and, uh, you know, and some of the dioceses say, well, you know, if you're Irish, you know, today you don't have to abstain from meat, but you can have your corned beef. You know, it's like, I don't think St. Saint Fran- uh, Saint Patrick would approve of that. You know, it's, it's, it's just, it, they're weird. They're little exceptions that have damaged the rule. And so then it's, it's, it's just, it, it looks bad. The other, the other thing that also I found distressing is the way that some, the way that some things are explained. So, you know, so you're abstaining, you know, or another similar practice, you know, so if you can't abstain from meat, you can, make your own exception, do something else, you know? So it's like, I I don't, you know, I I don't know how one's, how one would be personally empowered and prepared to make that decision. You know, it's, it's, there needs to be some instruction. And, uh, you know, I think it's much easier. What we do in the Eastern churches is that uh, we, we give dispensations. So if someone in the parish says, hey, um, you know, I have this event going on and I know that they're going to be serving meat, Um, you know, they'll ask me, can I have a dispensation? I'll grant the dispensation. You know, I'll I'll try, you know, I may try to to say, well, um, you know, then fast from meat on Thursday, you know, like replace that day. Because there, there's something about it. The practice, you know, it was important enough for Jesus to provide the model for this. And, you know, and it's something that is consistently showing up in the Old Testament and the New Testament. So I think it's something that is, is worth it. It's an exercise that, that is part of being a Christian, you know, the Christian experience. And so, and it, it's not, 
it's not about depriving oneself. I mean, you don't, you don't eat, you know, we, there are extreme cases. So, you know, like for example, St. John Chrysostom, who, whose fasting was so extreme in the monastery that he caused himself physical harm. And he was not able then to eat normally for the rest of his life. And so that, that is an extreme case. That's not what we are called to. That's not what he was called to. You know, even he realized that that was a youthful uh, mistake. But, uh, you know, so, so it's, there are ways of getting what we need to be completely functional and normal. And yet, you know, practice that self-denial, you know, keeping it simpler, lighter, different. You know, that, and that's, there's, there, there's always a way to, to do it. And, and again, it brings you to consider and think about what you eat. That's, and that's not a bad thing because, uh, again, we do a lot mechanically. So better to think about it a little bit and, uh, and then reap the benefits. You know, that is part of this ascesis. And the, the monks and nuns, they do this all the time. You know, it's good for us to incorporate some of those practices into our life too. The shellfish, and that, that just reflects kind of a, a place where the church was about 1,700 years ago. The ancient Romans and Greeks, they thought of shellfish as being bugs. So they did not eat them. The poor people did. And not only shellfish, but like octopus, squid, you know, all of that has no blood and no backbone. And now things obviously have changed. You know, lobsters are no longer the cockroach of the sea. And, uh, you know, so there one has to make a certain responsible uh, assessment and say, well, you know, that's really not in the spirit of Lent. And You know, and shrimp are inexpensive relatively. You know, every so often you'll find something like that on sale. So, you know, I think that's okay as far as the variety is concerned. Uh, the same thing also is like one of the oils that is not used is olive oil. And, uh, and olive oil is not used because that was the most fundamental of ingredients in the Mediterranean. And so in, in places in Northern and Central Europe, so they would use animal fat. And so obviously animal fat would not be used. And, uh, but it was, it was supposed to be, not using olive oil was supposed to be, again, a way of changing the way one cooked so that it wouldn't be as rich. Because, uh, you know, olive oils are, quite good. Now we can substitute for that, we can substitute, um, you know, another oil, but it should be, it should be a cheap oil, you know, that we use rather sparingly. So it's more than in the spirit of that, but there are like some hardcore monastics who, instead of using oil, they're going to use water. You know, it's like, basically, I don't think that's, that doesn't really work in the same way, you know, so, but, uh, but, you know, so those are kind of little nuanced details. Okay, well, thank you for joining us this evening. Have a good night. Blessed is the kingdom of the Father and of the Son.